so now uh, this was the initial thing let us just quickly recall what we have already talked about this was my first lecture on regular local rings where uh, we started with the definition you know what the definition is that if embedding dimension this is the embedding dimension okay so let me use a marker yeah so this is uh, so by the way you have a noetherian local ring don't forget that that is always the assumption okay and then uh, you know, this is the symbol we use for minimal number of generators for a finitely generated R module, which makes sense because we are talking about a Noetherian local ring. And then mu m is basically this, this you know. And the embedding dimension is defined to be this, uh, uh, the, the number uh, dimension uh, of this vector space, m over m, m square over the field k. Okay, this is mu m, this is what is called the embedding dimension and what is a uh, regular local ring when the cruel dimension matches with the embedding dimension. Otherwise it's an inequality, right? Okay, so uh, after this, then we immediately saw that dimension zero and dimension one are two very interesting cases. Dimension zero, of course, you know what it is. So uh, we could uh, immediately come to this definition. I don't want to run through the entire stuff so let me show you some uh, very important uh, places. Yeah, so this was a kind of a recapitulation of what you have already seen in Professor Patil's lecture. Okay, and then I said that, uh, let me take you to this particular place. Yes, so a quick recapitulation of the definition of system of parameters and a very important corollary that uh, when you go down, uh, go modulo, uh, uh, if, you, if you have a string of elements in the maximal ideal M, and when you go modulo this submodule, then what happens to the dimension, okay? And uh, then equality holds if and only if this can be completed to a system of parameters. This is very, very important. This is what is used everywhere. And I, as I have already told you in my previous lecture that the whole, uh, the, a major technique is the inductive method, and this helps us to reduce the dimension, okay? And uh, this is the case when you have just one element and a non-zero divisor, and then what happens? And after that, we are using this to prove such results that if you have a regular local ring of dimension D, then for elements T1, T2, TR in M, this is a part of a regular system of parameters, and R mod, this ideal is a regular local ring of dimension exactly D minus R. So it has dropped down by R. These two conditions are equivalent. This is what we have proved, but this is extremely useful and which has been used here. So for example, yeah, this, these are certain things which you have to sort of just remember because now what we will do is we will use them uh, every, everywhere. Okay, and something more. So if you have a regular local ring of dimension D and if you have a T non-zero element and if T avoids M square, this is saying that if and only if this is a regular local ring of dimension D minus one. This is very, very useful that if you choose an element which is not in M square, you know what it means that if T is not in M square, that means you will have a non-zero element in M mod M square and then you will complete it to a basis. That's the whole idea as a, I mean a K basis, right? And then uh, automatically, you get a generating set, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so these proofs are uh, kind of very, very uh, kind of the uh, natural thing that could happen, and it really happens that way. And then using this, we could prove a very important structure theorem that every regular local ring is an integral domain. Okay, so this uh, this uh, proof again, you please go through and uh, discussion sessions uh, or rather tutorials are there. Uh, to discuss these matters. And I told you, right, dimension zero and dimension one are the initial cases, which are very, very interesting. And this Noetherian local ring of dimension one, this is regular local if and only if it's a discrete valuation ring. So this is what is very, very interesting. And uh, I said that a quick uh, theorem, which sort of gives you all the equivalent uh, properties of, uh, of a discrete valuation ring are these. And you can take any one of these as a definition uh, for your uh, understanding, right? So uh, the, you can see that it's a local principal ideal domain and R is not a field. Then you have some more 
and this is something which we will be using that r is noetherian and local and its maximal ideal is non zero in principle now this is exactly what is uh, what comes very very useful for proving this kind of a statement okay okay so uh, more or less these were the main things and then a bunch of corollaries and here this is a very important part that what i told you right if something can be completed to a system of parameters then the dimension drops down you, you saw that a uh, few slides back and that is what is used and then we have equivalent criteria for a regular local ring that means r is regular a noetherian local ring of dimension d regular if and only if these are uh one of these uh, if if it holds good then all others should hold good that's the idea so this is what we uh we have talked about in the yeah we have talked about in our first lecture on regular local rings now we are coming to some more characterizations as i have already said that homological characterization is what i plan to do today and then there will be jacobian criteria and if time permits we will also talk about the differential characterization using derivations and the module of keller differentials okay now for the homological characterization i need to again take you back to lecture 6 a quick recapitulation is required if you remember we talked about homological dimensions because this this characterization will be in terms of the global dimension okay of the ring so let us quickly run through it because uh, um i don't know if you uh, remember every bit but at least quick uh, recapitulation helps so we talked about injective dimension first if you remember this was the definition that if you have an injective resolution of length less than or equal to n and you but take all those n's and take the infimum that is what is called the injective dimension okay and then you have all these possibilities that it is plus or minus infinity and zero okay and also less than or equal to 0 uh, well this is the uh, this is how we define it that this is minus infinity if and only if m is 0 is plus infinity if and only if m has no finite injective resolution and it is less than or equal to 0 if and only if m itself is an injective module okay so uh, this is the injective uh, so this is how we denote it by idmr okay where m is uh, a module over r okay now <clears throat> this is a proposition that we prove that injective resolution of length less than or equal to n if it exists then that can be uh, formulated in terms of vanishing of fixed modules we saw that this actually is a very very useful uh, stuff this derived functors because we we i told you right i mean many a places when you are using a projective resolution or an injective resolution finally for proving some statements you actually sort of use these derived functors and look at their vanishing okay and that that is that gives you a very good homological technique so this we proved and that uh, existence of an injective resolution of length less than or equal to n amounts to uh, this one of these following conditions that is vanishing of the x and then yeah so therefore your injective dimension of a module can be safely translated in terms of vanishing of x that uh, that uh, there, there is a uh, what is the supremum of the i such that there is an r module n with this is true but what is interesting here is that you see gradually you are kind of making this n more and more special first it was some r module n then it become finitely generated r module n and then it become cyclic r module n this we have already talked about this is a very nice way by which you can sort of specialize and you can show that it is good enough to talk about cyclic r modules n and then all these numbers they become equal okay so and similarly uh, okay yeah now this is something very very important okay when we you, you will see in uh, in in a few minutes that we will be using this kind of result so if you have a short exact sequence of r modules and if you know that the injective dimension is greater than this injective dimension then you always have that this equality this comes uh, turns out to be really useful so now is the time to see an application of these results these homological uh, methods okay so this we could prove uh, in a conclusive fashion and then let me take you to some more results which will be very very important now 
Um, yeah, these were some. Yeah, then similar in a similar fashion, we could define a projective dimension. You know, it's not difficult to understand. Instead of an injective resolution, you take a projective resolution, and then same thing basically. You uh, you take projective resolutions of length less than or equal to n, and then take these n's and take the infimum. Again, you have these cases minus infinity, infinity less than or equal to zero. So uh, these are the situations, and you have similar results that. Once you have projective resolution, then you have the vanishing of X modules. If you remember, I uh, made a very explicit uh, mention of this, that X is a little delicate to work with because you have both the places. And you can see that your uh, uh, which place you are using, that kind of decides quite a few matters, right? So please uh, spend some time, go back to uh, just see them in parallel that the injective and maybe I can do it for you. That just let, let, let me show you because this will be useful. So one is if you have an injective resolution of length less than or equal to n and look at the vanishing conditions of the X. And you have a projective resolution of length less than or equal to n and look at the vanishing conditions of X. Do you see, uh, what, 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 do you, what do you see uh, from this? Can somebody just speak it out? So injective resolution is uh, decided with respect to the which which variable? I mean, the first or the second one? First one is the variable. Second one is your module that you are working with. Okay. Here, on the other hand, your second one is the variable. And the first one is the module that you are working with. Okay, so some quick mnemonics, just keep that in mind because it helps. Because for projective uh, resolution, so this X actually, this this very nice uh, playing with both the places does take care of both the situations of injective resolution and projective resolutions, okay? Okay, <clears throat> similarly, I'll have a result, just a parallel you can draw, okay? So you have the projective dimension writing in terms of this. Yeah, see? So we have this, that uh, it's the supremum. And then if you have this uh, so similar statement that you have this formula, right? Just like this one, assuming that the projective dimension is greater than the projective dimension of M. And uh, then you have, if you, uh, so similarly, we could prove that when you can have, if you have such, uh, such an exact sequence of R modules, um, such that projective dimension is less than or equal to n and pi is projective, then you can say that n is projective. If you remember, we used it and this is very, very helpful. Okay, so uh, something similar to what you have seen here that you have injective dimension less than or equal to n and if all these are injective, then you can conclude that uh, your, uh, sorry, if you have the injective dimension is less than or equal to n, you can conclude that this is injective. So it's just going parallel, just the arrows have to be put in the right order. Okay. And uh, finally, yeah, okay. So now uh, let me uh, just quickly talk about global dimension and then uh, we will uh, use them and go uh, in the regular local rings. Okay, so global dimension. What is the uh, definition? So once you have you have defined global injective dimension, global projective dimension, and finally, then uh, we could show proof this lemma that these two are the same for R. Okay, and once we have done that, yeah. So therefore, since you have the global injective and global projective are the same, that is what you call. That is what you call the global dimension. Oops. Yeah. So this is what you call the global dimension de denoted by GTR. Okay. And uh, we have this proposition. Once again, you can see this similar thing. We are reducing it to more and more uh, special cases. And uh, now this is something which is uh, which is really really very, very decisive and helpful, and it will be uh, helping us immensely. So what if we are saying is that, see, previously we were not specializing on the ring. If you remember, this is the first place where sort of uh, we started saying that, okay, let us now uh, focus on Noetherian local rings and things like that. Also for uh, flatness, we did uh, have to assume when you uh, prove those uh, uh, 
the more uh, advanced results for flatness, especially in the context of the fibers. Okay, so uh, then these are equivalent. This we could prove, and now this you will see an application. A condition using the vanishing of tor and let me take you to yeah so okay so do remember this now this is something which will be immensely helpful for us that the global dimension is actually the projective dimension of the field as an r module okay so this is what will be useful for us okay so you are working with the noetherian local ring and then this is the statement that we have already proved that the global dimension of R is the same as the projective dimension of the field R mod M. And uh, yeah, similarly, this is, a, this is a result which we have proved that if you go modulo a non-zero divisor, if A is in M and it's a non-zero divisor on M, then the projective dimension is uh, given by this formula, okay, and with the possibility that both the sides may be plus of infinity. Some more technical results, yeah. So uh, please do remember that this is something which will be uh, which will uh, be used, which will give us uh, a lot of uh, uh, this thing, uh, kind of a very useful technique, and also this, okay. So let me now. Uh, start with so maybe i'll just keep uh, one uh, window open here let me see how to do it yeah okay yes so now we are uh, trying to prove the trying to prove certain uh, very important results and to begin with a homological criteria for uh, regularity okay so here it is uh, can you see it clearly by the way do i need to make it larger is there any problem? Can I keep uh, keep it like this? Is this fine? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Good. Because then I can actually refer back to the results. Okay. So you have a regular local ring. That means you know what it is. Noetherian local ring with that embedding dimension is equal to the cruel dimension, then the following statements are equivalent. So regular local and the global dimension is finite. These two statements are equivalent. Let us see how to do it and see uh, what results we keep using. Okay. okay, further, if any of these conditions holds, then GDR is equal to dimension of R. Uh, by the way, I mean, uh, before I uh, go to proving one if and only if two, why is this true? If it is true, suppose R is regular local, then, then why is global dimension equal to dimension of R? Can somebody answer quickly? So global dimension, you know, you can also keep this in mind that global dimension of R is actually given by the projective dimension of R mod M. By Auslander Buschbaum. Okay. So uh, we will uh, see Auslander Buschbaum uh, will come in a very big way. Okay, we will just touch upon because uh, Professor J.K. Verma will be uh, uh, talking about it uh, in greater detail. Okay, so let us prove one implies two first. So R is regular local. Therefore, you know that M is generated by a regular sequence of the correct length. D is the cruel dimension, right? Okay. So therefore, if you look at the projective dimension of R mod M, because remember, what do we have to prove? We have to prove that the global dimension is less than this. So, and you know already that projective dimension is the same as the global dimension, right? So therefore, if I can show that this is finite, then I'm done, basically. So this is projective dimension of this, and this is D plus projective dimension of R. Have we used some result here? Have you seen this in these slides? Going modular non-zero division. Uh, sorry? Going modular non-zero division. Precisely, yeah. 
So you just keep on doing it, and therefore it's going modulo one non-zero divisor already. You reduce this. I um, mean, like you have the addition formula. Okay. So therefore you have the projective dimension of R. Now uh, this is zero, and this is this, right? Therefore you have this. I hope it is clear to all of you. Okay. So one implies two is uh, your kind of the easy part, but two implies one. That means if you have the global dimension is finite, then you have to prove that R is regular local. Okay. So let us let us do it. Now here there's a bit of work to do. Okay. So uh, proof is by induction on mu m, this minimal number of generators. Okay. If this is zero, then m is zero and R is regular local. Greater than or equal to one, that means M cannot be the trivial one. So therefore, M is contained in, uh, I'm sorry, not contained in M square by Nakayama, right? Otherwise, M will be zero. So uh, moreover, this is not R free. Again, somebody, why not? Why not? However, obvious it is still uh, speak out. R mod M is not R free because it will be important. I mean, uh, if it is free, then it should be flat. And there is a criteria of flatness that uh, I square should be equal to I. Okay. So, okay. So. okay. okay. So uh, now this part, although you can see, I have explained it uh, here. I've explained it here. Now, therefore, now this is very, 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 very important where actually you invoke Auslander books one. Uh, Nikhilesh was making a mention of this a uh, couple of minutes back that once you have, this is not free, therefore you can conclude that depth must be at least one. Okay, so well, this, uh, this is the way to prove that, by the way, just, let us just quickly make a mention of it, that if you have a finitely generated module over a Noetherian local ring, and if you have a finite projective dimension of M, then you have this addition formula. This is what is called the auslander Buxbaum formula, that projective dimension and depth, they add up to the depth of the ring, okay? And as, an, as a corollary, it follows that depth is zero implies that uh, if you have a finitely generated R module, uh, and if it is a finite projective dimension, then it must be free. So therefore, if you have that finitely generated R module is not free, so depth cannot be zero, and therefore it is at least one. Now, this is what uh, kind of uh, kind of gives you the technique to go ahead, because once you know that depth is at least one, then you will start with a non-zero divisor, and then you know, I have been uh, saying this number of times that uh, always the whole idea is to kind of cut down because your technique is inductive. Therefore, you will cut down the dimension and everything and then go modulo by going modulo that ideal and then you will uh, use the inductive induction hypothesis. Okay, so now how you do it is the following. So therefore, M contains a non-zero divisor. Okay, and therefore, M cannot be contained in this uni union of all these associated primes. Fine, and therefore, M cannot be contained in this bigger union also. That is, you know, the uh, prime avoidance because you know that M is not contained in M square, M is not contained in this, therefore you have this. Once you know this, now A is a non-zero divisor, therefore, now you choose a T in M such that T, yeah, sorry, I just, uh, yeah, not A, a T. So uh, you, you choose a T such that T is not here T is n. If T is not here, therefore T must be a non-zero divisor. That's clear, right? Okay, because your zero divisors are sitting inside. So we have, therefore, this is less than infinity. Is this clear? Is this inequality clear to all of you? The projective dimension of uh, M over R is less than or equal to the global dimension and that is finite. What makes us say this? It's the supremum. Global dimension is supremum. Of therefore, therefore, you have this. This is the supremum. And now, why this? How are we suddenly going to this? Are we using T here? 
Yeah, t is a non-zero divisor, so going modulo t will not change the projective dimension. Perfect, right? So therefore, you see that all the time your technique is more or less kind of uh, set that you somehow have to kind of uh, fetch that good non-zero divisor and uh, that is coming uh, from you know that you have depth uh, is uh, it, ha it it is at least one and then you have existence of non-zero divisor and you are having that non-zero divisor it's kind of very special that that non-zero divisor is also not in m square now that is what we will make use of okay so first of all we have therefore that this is projective dimension is less than infinity so you can understand that you have already started towards that inductive process that you have gone modulo a non-zero divisor this is your new link and also you have this m mod tm okay now comes this claim that m mod tr okay so this you know what it is is isomorphic to a direct sum and of m mod tm and we will let us see uh, how uh, how we use this right so if we assume this claim, then this is a direct sum and of this. Is that clear? If you assume that this is a direct sum and of this, is isomorphic to a direct sum and of this, then tor, how does it distribute over direct sums? Is it, does it safely distribute? Do you remember some results from our lecture three or lecture four, whatever, I don't remember. Can we say this? This is important because we have to finally come to a conclusion that of, of a finite projective dimension. Remember, uh, we have the induction to work. Uh, induction is our method. So basically what we are working on is this. If mu m is greater than or equal to one, then we, we are proving that global dimension is finite implies regular local. And now what we have done is we have created a new ring R mod TR. Okay, we will use that. And then we will use the induction hypothesis, go back to R mod TR, R mod TR regular, and then we will use some other result to conclude that R is regular. That's the whole idea, fine? And that you have already seen in our uh, lecture eight, I have already shown you that some result is there by which you can finally conclude that R is regular and local. So we are basically doing this, that two implies one. Please don't forget that. The global dimension finite implies this. So now coming back here, yeah, so uh, I'm saying that since toad is also a direct summon, Therefore, one projective dimension is finite implies this projective dimension is finite. That is obvious, but toad is a direct sum and is that part clear to all of you? Assuming this claim, of course. As an R mod T, R mod T. Fine. Tor is an analytic functor, no? No. You, you tell me what does it mean? Means uh, tor n of m m plus n. Yeah. It is tor m plus tor n. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you have this, I don't want to again go back to that slide. It will take some time. So basically, you are having this tor over this ring, and then with respect to k. And then this, if you have additive addition here, direct sum here, then it splits. Okay. Yeah. So use, you are using that. And therefore, since you have the sitting as a direct sum, and therefore finiteness condition here would give you finiteness condition there because this is a direct sum and of this, right? This is a direct sum and of this. Okay. Good. Okay. So now, therefore, this shows that the projective dimension is finite of k as an r mod tr module therefore this gives uh, i'm sorry therefore we know that global dimension is the projective dimension you have right here and therefore we get that the global dimension is also finite so we are making the induction work by the way uh, is this part clear to all of you the exact sequence shows that the projective dimension is finite Are we using something here? 
for this projective dimension is one plus projective dimension of m plus t, m modulo t r. Yeah. And projective okay. dimension. So we, you have already seen, we have already uh, made a mention of this. Let me take you there and speak to you later. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we always have this, remember, that your, uh, if you go modular non-zero divisor or the moment you have that, I'm not able to find it. Where did I write it? I think it was somewhere. Uh, wait a minute. Here it is. You always have this. Don't forget, both for projective dimension and injective dimension, that whenever you have a short exact sequence, for if you have this, then you have this addition formula. So uh, are we using this proposition here? This is an exact sequence of R mod TR modules, right? Uh, do we know that uh, projective dimension of K with respect to R mod TR is uh, greater than zero because um, it's not uh, projective. K is not projective module. No, why do you need that? Uh, that uh, M is not equals to M square. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that if you want to make use of this, then it is enough to have this, hmm. right? Hmm. And you have an R mod TR sequence. Yes. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, so for using this proposition, we need to know that <clears throat> projective dimension of K is greater than, strictly greater than zero. Mm -hmm. okay. And, okay and and we have that m is not equals to m square right right so it is not projective means it has to be greater than zero right absolutely absolutely yeah so what is the conclusion then we know m is not equal to m square that that we know otherwise we wouldn't even get a non zero yeah. dimension yeah so projective dimension of k is 1 plus projective dimension of m mod t Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, now the point is this T not in M square, I told you, right? I mean, this is, hasn't been uh, used very explicitly. So I have, so far we have only used that T is not in the zero devices. Now T is also avoiding M square and therefore we have this. This is clear, right? So therefore this is a regular local ring by induction. So you have all the situation that you started for mu m greater than or equal to one, you um, go, went, uh, go down uh, in the sense that go modulo by, uh, by a non-zero divisor, and therefore you have the global dimension finite, and you remember what we were proving. We were proving if global dimension is finite, then we have a proving regular local ring. And now also, we, since we have mu is strictly less than this because of the avoiding m square, therefore this is a regular local ring. Okay. Now, since t is a non-zero divisor, we know that this is true, where d is the dimension, it drops down by one. And this is a local, regular local ring. Therefore, this is generated by d minus one elements, right? And therefore, it follows that m is generated by d elements. Therefore, r is regular local. Is the last part clear to all of you? So once you have gone down a non-zero divisor, your work is more or less done. That's the main thing. But is it is the last part still? I would like all of you to have a careful look and uh, make sure that it is clear. So you have this is a regular local ring by the induction hypothesis. And since T is a non-zero divisor, and you have, since this is a regular local ring, this maximal ideal, you know, is generated by the right number of elements, okay? And that, it, it, you have a regular system of parameters. And therefore, M is generated by T. 
T elements, and that's exactly what you want. And T, you know already, it's a non-zero divisor. So therefore, you have a regular lookup. Okay. So modulo this claim, therefore, this is proved, right? So now you want to prove this that uh, this is isomorphic to a direct sum and of this. Okay, so how to go about that? Now here you have some uh, small technical details. Okay, so T is not in M square. Now see, uh, this is uh, again uh, being used uh, very, very effectively. So you extend it to a minimal generating set of M. You know how to do it. Uh, are you all sure about this, how to do it? If T is not in M squared, then extend it to a minimal generating set of M. Because T bar can be completed to a basis of M mod M squared. So. Yeah, actually, I wanted some answer from some other people who are kind of always very, very quiet. Yeah, absolutely. So it's kind of obvious that once you have M mod M squared and then you have a non-zero element extended to a basis and then you automatically have a minimal generating set. Okay, so Nakayama, uh, uh, like being applied everywhere. Okay, so now it, it follows from the minimality. Now these are a few checkings, please do it. I have put it under E stroke T, but uh, uh, you take them as exercises and do it. And then we will uh, again uh, follow up and have the, uh, have the complete picture. See, the whole idea here is the following, okay that uh, so what we are doing is let me take you to uh, these two equalities then you will understand what is happening so we want to show the claim if please remember that we want to show that m mod tr is isomorphic to a direct sum of m mod tm so basically i want a splitting of m mod tm now i am saying that m mod tm can be split in this way okay so uh, this uh, tr mod tm and this is a direct sum with this. Now this you have to check that why is it a direct sum? I just initially wrote sum and then it's a direct sum. So you have to check. By the way, whenever I am writing all these things, I am writing as what? I'm writing as modules over which ring? When I'm writing all these things, I'm writing as, as, as what? Say, so, or let us go back to the claim itself. I said M mod TR is isomorphic to a direct sum of M mod TM. I have written as which modules over which rings? I mean, they're the modules of course, but over which ring? R mod TR. Okay, so uh, now here, here, so please keep that in mind. Whole idea was to, whole idea was to use the induction hypothesis and go modulo a non-zero divisor and use the new ring that is R mod TR. Okay, so therefore, and then uh, the whole idea behind this, behind this claim is that you can use the tor and to show that the projective dimension is finite. And you can see this here that everything is being transferred to R mod TR. So we are writing these as, writing these over R mod TR. So this is one checking which has to be done that M mod TM, you can write this as a splitting like this. And then what was our claim? <clears throat> our claim was that we wanted to show that M mod TR is actually sitting as a direct summon and it also follows that M mod TR, M is TR plus A, why? Because <clears throat> A is this ideal generated by this T1 to TR and TR plus A is precisely your M. So this you can prove that is actually isomorphic to this. And finally it comes out to be this, okay? So this is your, this is your M mod TR sitting here. Okay, so just modulo these checkings, then what you are doing is the following. So you have this M mod TR sitting as a direct sum of M mod TM because M mod TR is actually isomorphic to this. And once you have that, then you can safely apply the tor condition 
to uh, conclude that the projective dimensions are finite. Okay, so this is the this is the idea. Now here, uh, so these checkings uh, we will uh, take it up. If uh, in fact this uh, certain parts will be taken up eventually, just uh, but you please go ahead and uh, verify these these green these green lines. These are not difficult. Just make you make use of the fact that once you have a minimal generating set of the n, and therefore. Once you have that minimal generating set everywhere, you will be able to show these things. But finally, uh, coming up to this is the this is the thing which is basically isomorphic to your. So basically, let me just quickly point out that this is what is going to be isomorphic to. Uh, okay, now. A corollary is the following, that if you have a regular local ring R, then localization with respect to every prime ideal is also regular local. Now, uh, this is indeed a, a very local condition that, uh, and this you will see that will be extremely useful. Okay, so how to prove this? Again, uh, we will use the homological technique that you start with the prime ideal, suppose the projective dimension is uh, N, okay? Then, for, by the way, uh, when we are writing this n, we mean this n is a finite number, right? The projective dimension of R mod P over R. So in fact, if you see the next line, you will immediately. Yes, because uh, it is an R module. Right? Oh, by the way, what is your name? Your name shows Redmi 5. So I'll change. Yeah, my name is Abdul. Okay. It always happens on the tutorial weeks. My name is changed to. Anyway, okay, right. <laughs> okay. So yeah, yeah. What, what, what did you say? What did you say? The R is regular local. So the global dimension is finite. R by P is at one one such moment. Okay, so uh, yeah, so you have the global dimension finite. That is because of the regular local, and n is definitely uh, just the projective dimension. It has to be less than or equal to this. Therefore, this n is also finite. Precisely. Okay, so now you, what you do is you uh, once you know that projective dimension is finite, therefore you can immediately go to uh, projective resolution, right? And then, you know, this is flat. Therefore, tensoring also keeps it projective. Okay, so you get a projective resolution here. Fine, tensoring by RP, you have flatness, projective resolution for this. Therefore, you have projective dimension is finite. Okay, but global dimension is the projective dimension. So therefore, global dimension is finite and therefore RP is zero. Okay, so uh, a, a homological uh, technique really uh, comes out to be very, very handy here that you just, uh, the global dimension finite, you immediately know. Again, if you are uh, not very sure, let me once again, uh, once again show you that please do remember this. This is your global dimension. So global dimension is basically the global injective dimension or the projective dimension. So you can see the usefulness that you, it's a supremum of the projective dimensions. It's a supremum of the, of the injective dimensions and they match. So uh, whatever is necessary, wherever you use that safely. So that's exactly what we are doing. That global dimension is basically, uh, we are using with the help of the projective dimension. That's it. And then you have, uh, then you have this result that, uh, you can further specialize and things like that, but we we that that we don't need it right now. Right? We just need this much that you have the projective dimension is finite, and therefore projective dimension is equal to global dimension. Therefore, global dimension is finite, and it's an equivalent condition for a ring to be regular local, and therefore you don't need the result. Okay, how is that useful? Is now uh, we will be uh, more specific in the sense that, yeah. <clears throat> So we are now extending the definition. We are saying that a Noetherian ring is regular at a prime ideal P. 
So you can see I've dropped uh, uh, this, uh, we are not saying local, just localization is a regular local ring. Then you say that it's a regular at the prime ideal P. And if we say that R is regular, if R is Noetherian and regular at every prime ideal P is paid off. Okay, I mean that for every prime ideal P. So this is the definition of regular. And now you have R is Noetherian, then R is regular if and only if R is regular at every maximal ideal of R. I'm just curious. So uh, if R is regular, then of course R is regular at every maximal ideal of R, right? Uh, how about the how about the converse? How about the converse? Can we make use of this? This says that if you have a regular local ring, then localization always keeps it regular local, right? So now here, I'm, I'm wondering that if I have just with respect to the condition, with respect to just the maximal ideals, then how do we get uh, regularity? Because RM is regular, so RM localized at some prime ideal is isomorphic to RP. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, I, that's why I've kept it as a, uh, as a, this thing. Uh, please um, uh, make sure that you just understand what Sampath has said just now. That uh, if you just localize with respect to maximal ideals and if you have the regular condition, right? So I'm asking why should it be there for regular? What is the definition of regularity? Regularity means it is regular for every prime ideal. So therefore you then again regular localize with respect to prime. And then you see that why just the maximal ideal takes care of it. Okay. So this is fine. But now this is uh, what is a very important, uh, very important uh, result. So what is it? We are uh, trying to prove that <clears throat> If you have a regular ring, then polynomial ring is also regular. Okay. So it is obvious that we just have to show it for one variable, isn't it? So you just prove that if R is regular, then just for one indeterminate X, Rx is also regular. Okay. So first of all, Rx is Noetherian. That part is okay. Now here you see a reduction technique. This is something which is very, very useful that uh, how you kind of reduce it to a situation where you may assume that R is in fact local. Okay, so that's the whole idea. So let us uh, do it. So you start with the maximal ideal of Rx. Basically, what do we want to show? We want to show that here, we want to show that maybe I should have added it here. Let me, let me quickly add it that, uh, yeah. So yeah, I should have added it. So uh, to show that, Your Rx n is a regular local. Right? That's what you want to show basically. Okay. Take the contraction to R, call it M. This is a prime ideal. Take this, uh, take this complement set. Then this is empty. Right? Therefore, this is a localization of this. What does it mean really? This Rx localized, so remember, please remember what is your, what is your S? S is R minus M, where M is the contraction of N. Okay, and then you are taking this localization, okay, where N is the maximal ideal. Then you are saying that this can be seen as a localization of this. So what is that? And the reason actually is here, right in front of your eyes. But still, uh, can you explain what do I really mean by this? Is a localization of this? What does that mean? Are we using some small observation somewhere? Rx localized it and means we are inverting elements uh, outside. Sampa, just a minute. Sampa, just a minute. So maybe I can... Uh, just uh, quickly uh, ask some more people that uh, um, others are absolutely quiet. So give it a try. So maybe uh, Ram Krishna. No, Ram Krishna is not responding. 
Manav, you want to give it a try? Ranjal? Yes, sir. So, what does this mean? Rx look like is a... I can't hear you. Hello, sir. Hello. Uh, cannot hear you at all. Hello. My voice is very faint. faint. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yeah. 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 Speak louder. So what does this mean? This this is a localization of this ring. So that means you will have to take some uh, some multiplicatively closed set out here, and then you can get this right. That's what it means. The, the localization of this ring gives you this. So what multiplicatively closed set would work here? That's what the question is, and that is actually here. I mean, if you see it a little carefully, we'll understand. Okay, Sampad. So like, uh, so like uh, Rx localized at n means we are localizing elements outside n. Outside and n. Outside n. n. Yeah. yeah and S already lies. Uh, okay. Yeah. N max. N is like, n. And then you know m minus s basically. Yes. Hmm. So the like, and localization of this thing at m minus s will work. Precisely. So basically, uh, I have, have you uh, seen any exercise or anything where it can be said a little more conclusively that it's kind of you, you take this and I'm just, I'm just instead of the heuristics, I want to see that give me, give me a localization of this so that you get this. That's what my question is. Give me a localization of this. What I mean to say is this localization of this so that you get this. Okay, so maybe I just put it uh, marked. Let me put it marked. Because these are some very uh, simple- It is uh, MRMX. It is MRMX, okay. Okay, so you mean to say that you just take that and then you localize with respect to that? And yes. get your Rx and exactly. So this you can do very easily. That if you take that contraction, you could localize with localize R, and then you localize with respect to that that extension of that M in RMX. Then you get back your, then you get back your this this ring, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> so this is uh, now this is very very useful. Why this is useful? Because see. You are saying that, so you see, see this comment, this is very, very important. So we may therefore replace R by Rn and assume that Rn is regular local and R intersection N is your M. Absolutely. Because if you can say that this is a localization of this, okay, so now this is your base ring, okay, and if you, now this is, this has become local. What do you want to show? You want to show that this ring is, this ring is regular, right? So, I mean, after you have shifted from R to RM, it's enough to show that this thing is regular. So therefore, you can assume that your base ring you started with is actually a regular local, fine, with the maximal ideal M. And then it's such that that maximal ideal N that you have started with for this Rx, R is regular local with maximal ideal this N. And the N maximal ideal that you have started with actually contracts to this maximal ideal M. Isn't it? So this is the very important reduction step, which helps us. So you are now in a situation where uh, your R is actually your R is actually a regular local ring, and the maximal ideal n actually contracts to the maximal ideal. Okay. So how does it help? Yeah. So you have a field situation, right? So what do you want to show? You want to show that. You want to show that this is a regular local ring. So you want to show that the maximal ideal is actually generated by the right number of good elements, right? That's what the aim is in a uh, naive uh, form. 
now if you uh, look at this n mod mx then rx mod this mx is basically this this is a field so therefore you know that this is generated by a monic irreducible polynomial fx so you just lift it and write it as gx bar for some gx in rx which you can do okay so then n is your n and gx right so this is your n what do you want to show you want to show that it is generated by the right number of elements and so that's what you are uh, moving towards because your n you know it's a maximal ideal of the regular local ring after that reduction step so therefore m is generated by d elements that's the dimension and hence n is generated by d plus one elements fine just tell me that uh, would that be enough if i just stop here what is the purpose behind this portion if i just say that yes now it is generated by d plus one elements and since i had r is a regular local ring of dimension d then rx is of dimension d plus one would that be enough or am i correct I have minimal number of generators. Yes, absolutely. So these are some small detailing. Please don't ignore that. See here, uh, the you have the right number of elements, but you have to say it is the right number of elements, right? So that's exactly what you are doing. That if you look at this dimension, then this is less than or equal to the embedding dimension, and this is less than or equal to d plus one. This you already know because you know that uh, the, who are the generators. Now, now comes that. Since your gx is monic, you have your monic irreducible polynomial fx, and gx is a lift. So if gx is monic, so you know that this is not contained in n. Again, why? I mean, not equal to n. I'm sorry, properly contained in n. Why? What is so special about gx that? Let's just say that. Remember what your n is. Don't forget, n is this. So I'm saying that g x is monic forces that your m x cannot be the entire coefficients n. can't be coefficients cannot be what? So your m x automatically. I mean, since you have a monic polynomial, therefore you cannot decide inside m x, right? So therefore you have a proper extension here. So therefore, you know this. You have the inequality, okay, and this is equal to this, and that shows that your dimension yeah. Just a minute, please. Sorry. Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah. So you have a proper uh, containment, and therefore you have this height, and this is height of m plus one. Is that clear? What makes me write this? Have you seen some result which helps you write this? What makes me write this is equal to height of m? I am asking about this equality.
So if that is done, then I have this, that it is here you showed that your dimension was, this is less than or equal to d plus one. And here you were showing that this is greater than or equal to d plus one because of this, right? And that shows the equality. But my question is, why is this true? Well, no, we didn't think psi to extend it ideal and psi to prime will be same. I didn't hear you clearly, Sampath. What did you say? Like, what, did no, you say? Didn't, for noid endings, we have height of uh, Px is same as height of P. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, precisely, which is being used here, that your height does not change when you go to this extension for the polynomial extension here. And uh, therefore, you have this dimension is also greater than or equal to d plus 1. And that shows that your dimension is exactly equal to d plus one, which is equal to the embedding dimension. And this shows that this is regular local. Okay. So, and then obvious corollary is this. So here, therefore, I mean, uh, once again, they maybe I, again, I just sort of, because doesn't, you are still probably, so please make sure that these are certain things which are absolutely clear to you. Just putting it under green line. And also, I didn't see much confidence here either. So, this is the portion. So, maybe I just put them under the stroke D to be explicit, which means that. Okay, so this sort of gives us the <clears throat> homological criteria for the regular local rings. So now uh, we are we know at least one good uh, criteria, and you, you could see that we have used lecture six extensively. So basic technique again remains unchanged. That every time we are going module to a non-zero divisor chosen smartly. So by smartly we mean this t naught in m square kind of thing, and then you are using induction, you are proving that in order to prove that it is regular local, you have to show that certain projective dimensions are finite, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Use the homological technique, show that it is actually regular local, and then you go back to your R. And please, again, I would like to point out that place where after showing that it is, uh, let me show you, this was very, very important. See, when you are going back from here you are, See, the moment you have regular local, you have proved that this is regular local by induction. And then you know your non zero divisor takes care of the rest. You have the dimension drop down by the right number, is regular local. This is generated by d minus one elements, and therefore your aim is generated by d elements. So, you know, this going back to the original ring is not a problem, et cetera, et cetera. So, this is kind of a very useful. Uh, homological characterization and then we will have what we call the jacobian criteria so in the meantime i'll just uh, sort of slowly again i would like to go back to the uh, the the, the uh, differential characterization but that's kind of uh, that that's that would that would take some time but let me again go back to the derivations do you have any questions here by the way here we have some these verifications are there, please don't forget that these you have to check that these are indeed, these intersections are indeed this. And then we were showing that uh, this proof is taken from Professor Balman Singh's book completely. So here, uh, this a, a, the main a, effort was to show that this is isomorphic to a direct summand and U store. That was the whole idea, right? And here you can see that these equalities will actually show that this portion is what is isomorphic to m mod tr, okay? And finally, and what is A? A is part of this generating set of m, where you have created this generator by extending this element and so on. Okay, and then you are using these facts that the global dimension is actually equal to the projective dimension and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so these homological 
techniques that we have talked about in lecture six. So any questions here? Otherwise, I will now again go back to the differential uh, criteria. Okay, so uh, please uh, go through these uh, detailing. And uh, as I've already said that any stroke T, please don't ignore. I mean, it has, uh, it means that it has to be checked and we can, either we will put it as a tutorial problem or it will be uh, discussed during the tutorial. Okay, so let me now uh, go to, just a minute, close this. Yeah, this is still in getting ready. So, yeah. So the differential criteria will be in terms of the module of Keller differentials. So that's what uh, we have to first, uh, you know, I mean, um, I think Professor Patil uh, was planning to uh, uh, discuss this in full detail, but since he's not very sure whether he will have enough time to do that. So uh, we discussed and thought that a little bit, at least the main results, if they can be uh, sort of mentioned then and in the context of regular local things, okay. but still some amount has to be done. Because otherwise, you know, this will not, uh, you, you won't be able to follow anything at all. Okay. Okay. So if you remember, I just had a quick mention of derivations in my uh, previous lecture. So I just quickly run through uh, those slides. So you have R and R dash is a commutative R algebra and M is an R dash module. So a map, which is an additive group homomorphism and satisfying the Leibniz condition is called a derivation. Okay. <clears throat> and when we say that derivation of R dash, it means your aim is R dash and derivation from R dash to R dash. Okay, you don't forget R dash is an R algebra. Okay. Now, these are certain things which are uh, very easy to uh, check. So, I just put them under e stroke T. So, you can just use induction and quickly do this, especially this one. That how derivation for a uh, monomial, how it, what kind of expression you get. Uh, basically application of Leibniz rule. Okay. And then uh, you have this, uh, that if you have a derivation and if you have a ring homomorphism, so S2 R dash, okay. And if you have another R dash homomorphism, where N is another R dash module, then this whole, this big composition is actually a derivation again, okay. And uh, one more, now this is very, very important. This is very, very important that uh, we are basically uh, giving um, this property, you can prove it very easily, that if you have a derivation, then kernel D is a subring of R dash, and D is R linear if and only if all these elements are sitting inside kernel D. Okay, so this, uh, this is the definition of R linearity. You can, I mean, R linearity uh, is understood, but what I'm saying is this is the kind of understanding of R linearity. And in that case, we say it's an R derivation and we often write it like this. Okay, this is just a symbol, you know, what is the meaning? The meaning is basically this, this is what is supposed to be. Okay, and every derivation is a Z derivation. That's kind of understood because of the defining properties. Okay, now uh, what is important is like, so let me uh, gradually move towards uh, the module of Keller differentials because that is what we will give it, give, it, give us a condition uh, for uh, for a ring to be uh, regular. In fact, the freeness of the module of Keller differentials will give us the equivalent criteria for regular regularity of a Noetherian local ring. Okay. So first we have to understand that, that and also we have to understand that how it connects to the derivation. That's the, what the main purpose is. And I'm just trying to create a kind of a minimum uh, basic information which is required so that you can understand that proof of differential characterization of a regular local. Okay, so first this is again uh, easy checking that this, the derivations from R dash to M, this is how we denote it. And if you are saying R derivations, by the way, don't forget R derivation means this. Okay, that means this is true. That D is R linear, that is the meaning and which implies and is implied by this is true. So this is the, uh, this is the collection of all R derivations. Then this is a subgroup of the uh, 
uh, R module homomorphisms from R dash to M this is the first uh, obvious point. Now comes a very important observation that this home R R dash M. So that means all the R module homomorphisms from R dash to M. This also has a natural R dash module structure via M. Okay, so this and this in turn induces an R dash, R dash module structure on the this the set of derivations. Okay, so when we then say that okay the uh, the the derivation module, then we naturally have the R dash module structure and R dash is an R algebra, so naturally you have the R module structure as well. But how it imbibes the R dash module structure is from this. So. Uh, can you uh, quickly uh, say what if, what do I mean by via M, an R dash module structure via M? What does that mean? So if I take a R module homomorphism and a scalar in R dash, how would you define, say, let us say C F? C is in R dash and F is an R, R module from R module homomorphism from R dash to M. How would that be defined? Can you quickly tell me? It's kind of the obvious thing to do, but I want to hear it from one of you. So multiplication by f of s, f of c. Yeah, exactly. Because m is an R dash module, right? So uh, therefore, so that's exactly what the meaning is. But you will see that this is very important. I mean, this will be uh, this will be made use of. Okay, so in particular, if M is R dash, because M is an R dash module, so obviously CF of X is CFX, that makes sense. I mean, so that's what the meaning is, that this R, R dash module structure naturally gives this also an R dash module structure. Okay, so now this, if M is R dash, then this is written as dar R dash R, and uh, it is in fact an R dash module. I mean, that's what I have again mentioned here, but you know what it is. Okay. Okay, so therefore you have this R dash module. Okay, R dash is an R algebra. This is an R dash module. These are all R linear derivations from R dash to R dash. Now this is the first uh, observation that if you have the polynomial ring, R dash is the polynomial extension of R in n variables, then there exist derivations d1, d2, dn in R dash R such that this di takes this xi xj to this Kronecker delta ij. So that means di of xi is one and otherwise it's zero. Moreover, these derivations are determined uniquely. And this is a free R module with basis d1, d2, dn. Okay, so now uh, let me, let, let, just we will go stepwise. It's not very difficult to understand, but as I have said, since I have not added all the details, it's, then it would be very, very long. And since it was not part of my principal plan, so I have just kind of made a summary, but you will understand. Let me just take you to the correct place. Just a minute, please. Yeah. Okay, so the proof is by induction on N. If N is zero, then the proof is clear. And if n is greater than or equal to one, n is zero means it's r, you can understand. And then r dash bar is what we are saying with one less variable. Okay, so x1 to xn minus one. And then we assume by induction that there exists derivations d1 dash to dn minus one dash in this r dash bar module, right? So that means what? Derivations from this polynomial ring to itself over r. And we want to extend that derivation to one more variable. That's the whole idea. That's the main problem. Okay. So, and you have these properties being satisfied that di dash of xj is chronic delta ij. I want di such that di of xj is chronic delta ij. But I therefore have to worry about what? I basically have to worry about mostly just the last variable. So, what we do is if we consider since these d1 dash to dn minus 1 dash, they are from where to where? They are from r dash bar to r dash bar, right? Okay. So r dash bar can be treated as sitting inside r dash. So therefore, these can be considered as derivations from r dash bar to r dash, right? So basically, therefore, they are. Uh, these are not just in this. We can say that these are also in uh, they are also in dir r uh, r dash uh, r dash comma uh, 
let me check. Yeah, r dash bar comma r dash. Okay. Now what we are saying is if I and but what is r dash bar? R dash bar is just r dash one less variable. Okay. This bar is uh, it's, it's 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 a very simple thing. It's just drop that last variable to make the induction work. So now this they can be extended to derivations from r dash to r dash by the following lemma. So that's what I mean. Like it's kind of very simple that if x is an indeterminate and m is an r dash x module, okay. So r dash x module, you, you know what we really mean in this case. So let d from r dash to m be a derivation. Then given any m in m, d extends uniquely to a derivation dm from r dash x to m, such that dm of x is m. So you can make it happen that you start choose your element here. Then you can extend the derivation in such a way that this extra with this variable goes to that m under the derivation. Moreover, if d is an r derivation, then so is dm okay so you can actually i mean uh, well it's understood i mean i've already said it that it extends to a derivation of this so uh, if you have r derivation that means if it is r linear then r linearity will remain unchanged when you extend it and this is how you do it that if you are if you start with an a polynomial here write it like this where bi's are in r dash then if you define it like this dm of fx is equal to this, uh, this is the formal uh, derivative, f dash x m plus, then you apply d b i's and then x to the power i. You can check that this is going to give you an r derivation, okay? And uh, with the uh, with the condition that this actually gets mapped to uh, your, if it is your x, then you can see, then in your x means you have just b1 out here, right? And uh, everything else is zero. And then you can see that it is going to be just m, okay? So now this, uh, how this helps is that, uh, so therefore you have these, they are from this one less variable to, you are treating them inside R dash. R dash is this. Okay, so these derivations, I'm taking the, I'm taking the uh, codomain as R dash because this is contained in R dash. And I have by this lemma, I have extended them let this be the unique extension of these derivations with di of xn equal to zero, okay? For one i in between n minus one and dn of xn is one, fine. Again, let dn be the extension of the zero derivations as that dn of xn is one. So this is what I want. So what we do is we just extend the zero derivation and choose that element m to be one and then extend that, okay? With the choice of m equal to one. And therefore, you get your dnxn equal to 1. And therefore, you have the required derivation. Okay. So, uh, so this, how, how this helps? This is very, very important. How this helps is the following. So, what, you have, what have you proved really? I mean, if you just go through it, you will understand it's uh, not a big deal, but it really says a lot of things. So, if you have this polynomial extension, okay, then you can actually have derivations which are just taking these variables to one and the others to zero. I mean, each of these very de derivations, okay? Moreover, these derivations are determined uniquely and I am saying that you have a free R module structure with respect to this, okay? So now that really helps us. So what we are saying is the following. So yeah, let, let me show you this. Take a derivation and Delta B this, fi di where fi is d of xi okay so basically uh, di is the derivation that you have just now uh, proved that they exist di of xj equal to chronicle delta ij and your fi's are given by dxi then you can write that delta xi if you write then what will you get obviously you are going to get your dxi, these are your fi's, right? So these are actually dxi's for our life. So, and this is by this lemma that if you know that an art derivation, uh, if you have an art derivation that is determined uniquely by its effect on a set of R algebra, uh, set of R algebra generators, okay? So now this is what is, uh, what is very, very important that therefore you have uh, d equal to delta, how does it help? So how it helps is the following. First, you are showing that this generates this as an 
uh, as an R dash module because you will just start with the derivation and then you will choose these scalars as in this way and therefore you can write you can write this as a linear combination over R dash. So this is the first the generating set and finally you want to show the linear independence but that is easy right I mean if you have you already have di of xi equal to 1 and di of xj equal to 0 for j not equal to i. So standard technique. So therefore, if you act it on xj, then you know that it will immediately give you your gj. And therefore, you prove that this is a basis of uh, uh, of the derivation module, uh, the r dash module, the r dash r. Okay. And these are the, these derivations are what are called the partial derivatives and be denoted by this. So you have the uh, a um, kind of a, a completely formal definition of these partial derivatives. These are the derivations. R dash is a R algebra, and these are the derivations. In this case, it's in particular, the polynomial algebra, and you have these as the derivations. Okay, so uh, let me quickly just uh, indicate one more thing and then stop. So every R derivation of this has a unique expression of this form because that's what exactly these are your DIs, right? With DI in this R in Rx. So this is your basically, uh, don't forget, this is your R dash. Okay. In fact, these BIs are DXI. We hope you understand this. This is clear. Now, this is uh, really going to be useful. So, what is the what is the message that you need to carry along is that if you have a polynomial extension, then your derivation module of R dash uh, over R, so that means R linear derivations, that's a, that's a finitely generated free module with the basis D1, D2, Dn. They will be eventually called del del x1, del del x2, and so on, del del xn. Okay, and uh, this is a free R module with, I'm um, sorry, oh, sorry, R dash module. Okay, yeah, that's what we have proved. So that's what you have to remember. Okay, so now let me just introduce the differentials and then we will uh, again do it in the next lecture. So let me define it. So you have a commutative ring with identity, R dash is a commutative R algebra. Now, uh, take it as a proposition and also as the defining property. So there exists a pair omega D of R dash module omega. So this is an R dash module and an R derivation. You know what R derivation means. That means it's R linear derivation from R dash to omega, unique up to a unique isomorphism with the following universal property. So what is the universal property? It's kind of understandable. So you have the derivation here, R derivation here. If you have any other R dash module M and an R derivation D, then it immediately you get a unique R dash homomorphism such that this diagram is commutative. So this is the universal property of the uh, of this uh, derivations or rather this module this module is what we will be calling the module of scalar differentials. Okay, and we will have uh, we will see that uh, how 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 we can see this as a dual and things like that. And eventually, this module will give me a very nice criteria for the regularity of Noetherian uh, locality. Okay, I'll stop here.